Good afternoon to everyone, yeah, and uh, good morning to some of you. Well, first of all, you have certainly seen in the last YouTube video, yeah, or in the lecture notes, how easy it was to determine yeah, the response function of an interferometer composed of the N telescope apertures. Yeah. So I, I think that the proposed demonstration, yeah, was a bit too much detailed, yeah, and you could certainly make use now, yeah, of all the free transform properties, you know, that have been presented to you by Professor Desch, yeah, and uh, during some of my previous lectures, yeah, to make the same demonstration, yeah, in just two or three steps, yeah. And uh, so I think you have uh, good tools in your hands, yeah, to, to proceed further, yeah. Now, uh, until now, we have only considered the case of a symmetric celestial sources, yeah. And you've seen that the, well, the complex degree of mutual coherence, yeah, that uh, is named gamma or gamma one, two, yeah, is a complex quantity. But for all the symmetric sources, we found that it was a real quantity, yeah, or function. For instance, yeah, for the case of a double star equally bright, yeah, we found that it was a cosine function. For the case of a circular stellar disk, Remember, it was a first order Bessel function divided by its own argument. Well, for the case of a square stellar disk, yeah, it was a sin function, etc. Yeah. So we may wonder, well, when is this complex quantity really complex? Yeah. And we will see in a moment that this will be the case yeah, for any celestial source which is asymmetric. And uh, this is the purpose yeah, of the first video I, I will show you in a moment, yeah? So remember that gamma one two, yeah, the complex degree of mutual coherence, since it is a complex quantity, it is equal to its module, yeah? But the module we've seen is a visibility, yeah, of the fringe patterns, yeah? But times now an exponential function, which is complex, and the argument, yeah, of that function, yeah, is the complex number i time beta one two, where beta one two is a phase shift that we will try to determine. Yeah? Now, well, every case when the source is asymmetric, yeah, then you would find that beta one two is either equal to zero or to pi, yeah? which means that the, the complex exponential function will be either equal to one or to minus one. Yeah? So, I will proceed now with the video. So I press. We have represented in this GeoGebra video an interferometer with a variable horizontal baseline length, with resulting in the variable space frequency u that I set now at the value of 0 0.42, and three stars, which projections on the plane of the sky are the circular disk and a two asymmetric triangles as seen by the horizontal baseline. Let's first concentrate on the circular stellar disk. And I remind you that the small central surface element, represented in blue, gives rise to a system of fringes on here below, with maxima and minima reaching zero and centered at x equal zero. We have also seen that all the surface elements located along a line passing through that point and being perpendicular to the interferometric baseline. So I will show this one, which is shown here. Will produce similar fringe patterns and will thus reinforce yeah, the former one. Here I show yeah, the resulting pattern of fringes, yeah, reinforcing, yeah. Well, the previous one. Now the maximum intensity of this fringe pattern will be proportional, of course, to the length of the vertical stripe. And we need to visualize now the fringe systems due to all the vertical stripes covering the stellar sources. And for this, I will proceed with a small animation. You see the blue stripes scan the stellar sources. And we see below, yeah, the contribution of each of those vertical stripes. I will just stop the animation when it comes back to the center. Now, what we need to do yeah, is just to co-add yeah, all these uh, 
fringe patterns. And this result here yeah, in a stronger fringe pattern, which is still centered yeah, at x equals zero, and essentially due to the symmetry of the stellar sources in this case. And consider now the case of the first triangular star. And similarly, the small central surface element shown here in brown color gives rise right to a system of fringes shown here below. Still, yeah, centered here yeah, at x equals zero and with maxima and minima reaching zero. And let's visualize the contribution of the stripe passing through that point and perpendicular to the baseline. So I show it here. So this is a vertical stripe. And uh, the resulting fringe pattern. And let's also show here yeah, all those fringes due to all the other stripes. And for this year, I will still proceed with the animation. And then at the end, we shall quad all of them. Here is the animation. And we see that because the source yeah, is asymmetric, there is a shift yeah, in the display yeah, of these fringe patterns. Yeah, we got a stronger excess yeah, on the left side yeah, than on the right one. Normalization, yeah, the resulting system of fringes is still the same period and is slightly offset, as we see here, yeah, towards the negative values of X, essentially due to the asymmetry of the celestial source. Let's finally consider the case of the second triangular star seen here. And similarly, the small central surface element shown here in yellow color, gives rise to a system of fringes, shown here in yellow color, with maxima minima reaching zero and centered at x equals zero. And let's visualize the contribution of the stripe passing through this small surface element and also though due to all the other stripes. And for this, I still proceed yeah, with the uh, animation. So we see uh, now the yellow vertical stripe scanning the whole triangular star. And we see that there is a systematic, systematic offset yeah, of the fringe patterns to the right side yeah, due to the asymmetry of the stellar source. After quadding all the individual fringe patterns and uh, normalization, the resulting system of fringes is still the same period and is now slightly offset towards positive values of X due to the asymmetry of the triangular celestial source, which is differently oriented with respect to the previous one. As seen during the previous lectures, the intensity of the resulting fringe patterns is given by the following expression, where we see the module of the complex degree of mutual coherence, which is the visibility of the fringes. And here we see appearing yeah, the intrinsic source phase angle beta one two, that can be measured yeah, from the precise positioning of the fringes yeah, in the focal plane of the interferometer. Now, I also remind you that the complex degree of mutual coherence yeah, is just a product of its module by this uh, complex exponential function where we see yeah, the appearance yeah, of the intrinsic source phase angle. And uh, well, finally, if we know yeah, the distribution yeah, of the complex degree of mutual coherence in the UV plane, we see that by the inverse Fourier transform, yeah, we may determine yeah, the intrinsic normalized source intensity distribution over the sky. One thing I still wanted to show is that when uh, setting uh, the 
Tangier space frequencies to a value of 1.22, we see the, the fringe contrast. You see the 22. Fringe contrast, yeah, of the circular solar source gets to zero, yeah, so the visibility is null, and we know that we have resolved the stellar disk. Okay, that's the end of the video, yeah, and uh, you understand why, yeah, I just prepared the video because there were so many manipulations and the probability of uh, making a mistake, yeah, was so high, so large that, well, this was a wiser, wiser approach, yeah. What I propose here, yeah, is just, a, well, an application, yeah, of what you've seen now, well, to derive, yeah, the expression of the complex degree of mutual coherence for the case of a binary star, but a binary star which is not equally bright, yeah? Okay, so, first of all, yeah, I remind you, yeah, the expression, yeah, here of the complex degree of mutual coherence, which is a Fourier transform, yeah, here you see Fourier transform of the normalized density distribution of the source, yeah. Well, here is a detailed, yeah, Fourier transform written, yeah, in terms of the variable zeta, eta. And now, well, of course, the first thing to do, yeah, is to find the expression, yeah, of the normalized, yeah, intensity distribution of a double star, which is not equally bright. So you see here I wrote, it's a, intensity I1, time a direct function because, well, it's a point like star, and the second one I2, and I divide by the summation yeah, of their two intensities, yeah. And then along uh, the axis theta, I put minus theta zero two, minus eta zero two, meaning that the angular separation between, uh, yeah, the two stars, yeah, is the square root, yeah, of uh, the summation of the square of zeta zero and eta zero, yeah? So this is very basic. What you do then, yeah, you insert, yeah, this uh, expression two in uh, equation one, yeah? And just making use of all the properties of the Fourier transform, yeah, that uh, were shown to you, yeah, by Professor Dash and by myself, yeah? You can, you could then, uh, well, you can then get the following result. So we, we won't go through it now, yeah, but I just make use of the properties, yeah. And this is the expression we obtain. Now, well, we define the relative intensities of the two stars as being, for the first one, it's I1 divided by the summation of the two. And for the second one, it's I2 divided by the summation of the two intensities, yeah. Uh, now I jump to the second page and uh, I zoom a little bit. Maybe this is enough, yeah. And uh, while substituting, yeah, uh, this new quantity epsilon, well, you find that the expression, yeah, gets, can be written as such, yeah. And now if you'd like to rewrite, yeah, the expression of the complex quantity as being the product of the, its module, yeah, by uh, this uh, phase shift, yeah. What you do, you just uh, find that the module, yeah, is of course the square root of the summation of the square of the real part plus the square of the imaginary part, yeah, and you get this expression here. And for the phase, well, the phase is just the uh, arc tangent, yeah of the imaginary part divided by the real part, yeah? And you find this expression. Well, then I just wrote that some astronomers, yeah, prefer to work with the quantity uh, I to one, which is a flux ratio between the two stars. And if you do so, well, just a substitution, yeah, you get other expression for the visibility and for uh, the phase shift, yeah? But what you see is that uh, in this expression, the visibility depends, yeah, of course, on uh, the orientation of the baseline with respect, yeah, to the angular position of the binary star. It also depends on their flux ratio, yeah. And then it depends, of course, yeah, on uh, the UV frequencies, yeah, the spatial frequency. Now for the phase shift, yeah, it's exactly the same, yeah. It depends, yeah, on the flux ratio, 
orientation yeah, of the binary star, its angular separation, and the orientation of the baseline. Yeah? Now you see that if you set here i to 1 equal to 1, which would mean that equally bright stars, well, beta 1, 2 would be equal to either 0 or to pi, as we said before. Yeah? And the visibility, well, the uh, complex degree of mutual coherence yeah, would be a real quantity or real function. Yeah. Now, uh, just some illustration. So I go to the next page and then I zoom a little bit. Yeah. So here I have uh, represented, yeah. Well, it's an illustration also made with the GeoGebra, yeah. So it's a top view, yeah, of the UV plane. And uh, we are representing, represented here, yeah, given, the, the given vector U. So this is a baseline, yeah. Baseline yeah, corresponding to two aperture telescopes on the ground. So u equal one, v equal two. So you see it's a vector u equal one here, equal two there, and here is the vector. And there is another vector, angular vector z0, which is a, where the double star is located. So it's zeta zero one, eta zero one. So this is the vector here. So it corresponds to the separation between the components of the double star. Yeah? Now the dots you see here, yeah, all the dots, yeah, are projections you be playing, yeah, of the positions of the fixed baseline on Earth, seen every 30 minutes in time, from the binary star, yeah, starting six hours before and ending six hours after passing the meridian. Yeah. Okay. Now on, uh, well, this uh, 45 degree yeah, lines represents, in fact, yeah. The visibility, so the, the module of the complex degree of mutual coherence projected on the UV plane, yeah? it means that, well, if you would have a baseline yeah? uh, which would be scanning these perpendicularly, yeah? you would see the visibility varying yeah, as shown on the right graph here. You see? So visibility is not one, yeah? it's a small fraction of one which very much depends yeah, on the flux ratio of the double star. Yeah? And I think, well, I just provided to you here, yeah, uh, well, all the tools yeah, to make a more detailed analysis yeah, of uh, these, uh, well, I would say, uh, well, a kind of a research project. Yeah? And uh, from this, yeah, if you, you would have a special kind of star, binary star that you would like to observe with an interferometer, well, you could already start writing good proposal, good scientific uh, justification, and uh, well, no more or less, yeah, what you should do. Okay, now I jump to the next page. And what I've shown here is in addition, yeah, well, this is a 3D representation, yeah, of uh, the visibility uh, as a function of the UV frequency. But here on the right side, what appears, yeah, I think it's a kind of a gray color, yeah, is in fact the phase shift beta one two. And so you see that, oh, for the case of a non-equally bright binary star, uh, this angle phase shift is not equal to zero, neither equal to pi, but it, it oscillates between the two. And so you could make use also, yeah, of uh, the phase information to retrieve the parameters, yeah, of the binary star that you are just resolving, yeah, with a, with a interferometer. Okay, now I jump to the next slide. Yeah, and the next slide, yeah, is about the following. Uh, you may wonder, well, how do we find the UV coverage associated with the selected baseline yeah, on Earth, yeah? during the rotation of the Earth, yeah? And well, I just uh, made a detailed presentation yeah, in the PDF file, how you can yourself, yeah, calculate, yeah, what would be uh, the UV coverage of a given baseline, yeah? For instance, oriented north-south or east-west or, well, any direction, yeah? As a function of time during, well, taking into account, of course, the declination of the star, the latitude of the observer, yeah? And, uh, well, I will explain to you, yeah, 
how to do this yeah so i just go here and show you this picture yeah so here is a star so which is very far away of course yeah and uh, well, I choose the coordinate system with the Z axis, yeah, oriented from the center of the Earth, yeah, towards the star, okay? Now, the Y axis is perpendicular to the Z axis, yeah, and it is a part of the meridian on Earth, yeah, okay? So, it is as if when the, the star culminates, yeah, in the sky, yeah, well, the Y direction would be passing through the center of the Earth and perpendicularly to the direction of the star. And now the third axis, X, is perpendicular, yeah? And well, here it is shown in, in red. Well, I, I, I'll tell you in a moment why not in black. In fact, it's in black and in red, yeah? Okay. So now what is very important, yeah, are the coordinate X and Y because, well, from the star, the star sees, you know, everything projected on that plane, yeah? Because it's perpendicular to the Z direction, yeah? Okay? And, uh, well, the UV frequencies are, of course, defined, yeah? With respect to X and Y, since it is U is equal to X divided by the wavelength, and V is equal to Y divided by the wavelength. So, okay, this is already one coordinate system. Now, I define a second coordinate system, represented in red, yeah? So how do I get from the black one to the red one, yeah? Well, simply by a rotation around the x, x prime axis by an angle d, delta, where delta is a declination of the star, okay? Okay, so if you do so, then you find, this is trivial, that the z prime and x prime axis, yeah, are located in the equatorial plane of the Earth, yeah? And that the y prime axis, yeah, is oriented south north, yeah. So this is, uh, of course, yeah, uh, interesting uh, reference system coordinates named x prime, y prime, z prime. And now finally, I want to go from this one, yeah, to a coordinate system attached to the observer. Yeah. So what we do for that? Well, around the y prime axis, yeah, we make a rotation, yeah by an angle HA, where HA is our angle, yeah, okay, of the star, yeah, the, our angle, so it's a time difference between uh, its position in the meridian and at the moment you observe it, yeah, from your location. Yeah. Okay, and this is the system represented in blue, X second, Z second, and Y second. Yeah. So we make a rotation ar around the Y prime, Y second axis, by an angle H A, yeah? And now the observer, yeah, is located in that system at a latitude phi, and this is a phi you see here, and O represents the location of the observer. And there, in that reference system, yeah, you may define, yeah, well, a baseline, yeah, either oriented uh, south-north or oriented east-west, and any other baseline as being a composition of these two vectors, yeah? And this is exactly what, uh, well, I've been doing here. I've defined, uh, well, on the ground system, yeah, a unit vector oriented east-west and another one south-north, yeah, where you see the latitude, of course, yeah, of the location, yeah, comes in, yeah. And what we do now, well, and this is detailed, yeah, in the lecture notes, well, in, in this PDF document, I just, uh, well, determine yeah, the transformation from the x, y, z coordinates to the x prime, y prime, z prime coordinates, and then to the x prime prime, y prime prime, and z prime prime coordinates. And what you do next, yeah, uh, you just, uh, oh, this is too much. What you do next, yeah, you just uh, put the coordinates, well, this is a final transformation, to, to go from, uh, let's say, a given location on Earth, yeah, to the UV frequency. And when you set here, yeah, uh, the coordinate of any given baseline, which is defined as alpha times a unit vector along the east-west direction plus beta times a unit 
vector along the south-north direction, you obtain these final results, yeah? So you see that the UV frequencies, yeah, depend, of course, on the wavelengths, depend on the latitude of the observer, depend on the hour angle, depend on the declination of the star, yeah? And finally, depend on alpha, beta, which are the coordinates, yeah, of the baseline, yeah, on the ground, yeah? Okay, so this is something yeah, which may turn out to be very useful, you know, when planning some observations, yeah? Yeah, so how do I get to know, uh, yeah, which uh, angular space frequencies, yeah, I'm going to, to, to use, yeah, where, for a given star and at a given place where the interferometer is located, yeah? Okay, now come the next, uh, well, the last, I would say, yeah? Uh, but important uh, aspect of interferometry, which is the following. Yeah, well, in practice, yeah, how can I measure the intrinsic source phase angle beta one two? Yeah, because we've seen, yeah, uh, this angle measures the shift of the fringe patterns in the focal plane of the interferometer. And now I say, well, there are a few difficulties, yeah, before proceeding to with that measurement. First difficulty is that, well, the location of this fringe pattern depends, of course, on the precise pointing of the telescopes, yeah? And uh, what I've shown here, I'm not going to go through, through that exercise here, but is that if the star is not properly centered, yeah, uh, by each of the individual telescopes, yeah, what will be the result of that is that, and I just go straight to the, the result, yeah? Is that, well, the post spread function of each single telescope aperture will be shifted and the fringes will be also shifted, yeah? And this is not a real problem. Now, the second difficulty, yeah, comes here. It's, it's named the atmospheric piston effect. What is the atmospheric piston effect shown on this transparency? And this is more serious, yeah. Yeah. You see that, of course, uh, people, yeah, will use adaptive optics, yeah, to correct, yeah, for the deformation of the front waves, yeah, in front of each individual telescope aperture, yeah. So you need adaptive optics. Or you need a small telescope, smaller size, uh, and working in the infrared where you would not need adaptive optics, yeah? So with the big telescopes, yeah, one makes use of adaptive optics. Yeah? But this is not sufficient, why? Because the thickness, yeah, of the atmospheric layers above one aperture may still be different from the thickness of the atmospheric aperture, yeah, above the second aperture, yeah? This will introduce, yeah, the phase shift uh, phi one, above the first aperture and the phase shift phi two above the second aperture. And what I did in the PDF document, yeah, I just said, okay, let's take into account, yeah, uh, this phase shift, yeah. So you see, I'm just making a, well, the distribution of the complex amplitude, yeah, in the focal plane is the Fourier transform of the distribution of the complex amplitude in the pupil plane. So in pupil plane, yeah, we bring this correction, and second correction there, yeah? And then what we do, yeah? Well, we, uh, we just uh, proceed. Yeah, so I just try to see which, yeah. Uh, okay, so it will be here. Just lift a little bit. Just proceed with uh, all the properties yeah, of the Fourier transform. And wh what you would find, yeah? Is that, well, the response function, yeah? of uh, the interferometer is the same as before, but you see that in the cosquare uh, response function, there is appearance of phi two minus phi one. So the difference in phase shift yeah, between uh, the two apertures. Yeah? And uh, this phase shift yeah, very extremely, extremely rapid uh, because uh, of the you know, motions yeah, in the atmosphere. And well, the typical lifetime yeah, uh, is of the order of a few milliseconds. Yeah? So, well, every few milliseconds, yeah, 
the the layers, the thickness of the atmospheric layers, they have vary. And so you, what will happen in the focal plane is that the fringes, yeah, will just move, yeah, yeah, on one side, on, on the other. And, uh, well, you need a fringe tracker if you would like to, to integrate, yeah, uh, the fringes. And then, uh, well, you see how difficult it will be to determine, yeah, the value of a beta one, two, beta one, two, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, the intrinsic, uh, solves a shift, yeah. So, fortunately, there are solutions, yeah. And uh, I will just uh, come to the this aspect of the things now. Well, first of all, yeah, the solution. If the main target, yeah, is close to a reference star, and hopefully, yeah, brighter than the star of interest, yeah. Well, then it's possible, of course, yeah to follow the motions yeah, of the reference star and of your target of interest. And then it's easy yeah, to uh, correct for the, the atmospheric piston. Yeah? Or, well, it could happen that your object of interest yeah, is a point-like component in the continuum, yeah? and that you're in interested by the extended uh, region, which can be an emission line region, and that one you, you, you hope to, to resolve, yeah? So what you would do simultaneously, yeah? You would obtain data in the continuum, which would give uh, information on the point-like object, the point-like source, yeah? And also in the emission line, you would get information about the extended region. And uh, since uh, both, yeah, would move uh, due to the atmospheric piston, yeah? With the uh, same frequency, same motions, you could correct for it, yeah? But then still another possibility yeah, would be to try to, well, to do the following. Yeah? And this has been uh, inspired yeah, from a radio interferometry. Well, the idea now is to observe yeah, the target of interest simultaneously with the three telescope apertures, yeah? T1, T2, T3. And of course, above each individual uh, telescope aperture, yeah, you have a phase shift caused by different thickness of the atmospheric layers, yeah? phi one, phi two, and phi three. And what is shown yeah, in the PDF document, yeah, is that uh, if you make a simultaneous observations with these three telescope apertures, yeah, well, you may get rid of the atmospheric piston. Yeah? Now, very briefly, how to proceed? Well, I would go to, yeah, to this next slide where I explain yeah, uh, very briefly how to proceed. So you could say, okay, the phase shift yeah, affecting uh, the fringes between aperture one and two is composed of an intrinsic source yeah, phase shift plus the atmospheric yeah, piston yeah, phase shift. Yeah? And where well, you do the same for between telescope two and three, between telescope three and one. And then what, what you see is that if you co-add phi one two plus phi two three plus phi three one, you remember that phi one two yeah was phi two minus phi one divided by two, and if you co-add these three, you find that it is equal to zero, yeah. That's neat because if you now co-add yeah the three observed yeah phase shifts yeah, well these three will cancel out. And what will remain is just a summation, yeah? So a combination, inner combination of the intrinsic source shifts, phase shifts, yeah? Yeah, well, this is called, uh, in technical term, yeah, the closure phase technique, closure phase. And well, it is also referred in the literature as being the triple product of the complex visibilities or also as a bispectrum, yeah? So just remember that well, interferometrists are capable yeah, of getting rid of the atmospheric piston effect yeah, by simultaneously observing your target yeah, with three telescope aperture and then combining yeah, the light beams together so that you get rid yeah, of this effect. So this is uh, very nice. Yeah? And well, what I've also shown in the PDF document is that uh, this closure phase yeah, uh, is insensitive. Yeah? To the precise pointing of the telescope. Yeah, so even if uh, you are not properly uh, 
following yeah, your target, yeah, the closure phase yeah, takes into account uh, that effect. Yeah. Okay, now, uh, well, yeah, maybe just here below, yes, yeah, something interesting, yeah. So I just said now we made use of three telescopes, but what about if you are making use of n telescope apertures, yeah? Well, in that case, you could show that uh, if you use uh, n telescope apertures, yeah, instead of setting, uh, I would say, one constraint, because with three telescope aperture, you only set one constraint, when using n telescope aperture simultaneously, you may set n minus one times n minus two divided by two constraints. Why? Yeah. Well, if you have n poles, yeah, distributed on a plane, and you try to make, yeah, to cover, yeah, this plane with uh, independent triangles, yeah, so that if you coed all of them, yeah, you will cover the whole area, yeah, uh, including the n poles, yeah. But these tri triangles must be independent, yeah. How would you proceed? You would say, well, let's just choose one telescope. And this telescope, yeah, I may associate it, yeah, with n minus one other ones, yeah. Okay, so these are n minus one independent baselines. Now to make a triangle, yeah, I still need, yeah, to join this baseline with one more telescope, yeah. And therefore, there remain only n minus two possibilities, yeah. But if you think very well, yeah, uh, well, there are two times too many uh, uh, triangles because uh, you are taking one, then maybe uh, two and three, but you also included three and two and one, yeah? So therefore you divide by two. So you see how to get yeah, the number of constraints. Now, if we set here n equal three, we find that three minus one, two, two divided by one, it's one, or it's two, and two divided by two, it's one. So one constraint, yeah? So it works. Now, well, how many intrinsic source phase angles do we have, yeah? Well, this is the number of, uh, well, pair of telescopes, yeah, among n telescopes, yeah? So it's the number of combination, yeah, of uh, two telescopes, pairs of telescopes, yeah, take, taken among n telescopes, but they should not be the same, yeah? One and two is, is the same as two and one, yeah? So number of combination taken two by two, you know, we, we very well know that it's n times n minus one divided by two, yeah? And so it means that, well, the, the fraction, yeah, of uh, intrinsic source phase information retained by the closure phases, yeah, should be equal to this number divided by the other number, yeah? And if you divide, yeah, these two numbers, you find the fraction yeah, given by equation 27 that it is n minus two divided by n. So for n equal three, so we are using three telescope, we find that the fraction yeah, of information you may retrieve yeah, on the intrinsic source phase yeah, is 33.333%. Yeah. If you take a six telescope aperture, like the Shara array, yeah, so you set n equals six here, you find that, wow, it's already 66.7 percent. Yeah, so it's a lot of information. Now, if you take the Alma array, yeah, consisting of 66 yeah individual apertures, yeah, you find that you may recover yeah well almost 97 percent of the information yeah on the uh, phase uh, information due to the to the source. Yeah. Okay. Now I come to the last uh, last. Slide. Okay, once more. Can I just put it in? Yeah. So now I think that uh, you 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 got all the tools, yeah, to think about uh, the simple project, yeah. Well, and at the research level, what I would advise you to do is the following, yeah. So at the research level pro problem, consider the case of a double star, yeah unequally bright, yeah? And also maybe what you could do, well, a triangular star, yeah? So this is a, a star, well, one of the stars I showed in the video, yeah? And try, yeah, to find, yeah, what is a, 
complex degree of mutual coherence, so the expression of gamma, one, two. What is a module? Then you get the visibility. And what is the value of beta, one, two? Then you get the phase shift, yeah? And try to make uh, plots, yeah, of those quantities while varying the orientation of the double star, while varying the fixed ratio. And then, well, the next application would be, uh, well, what, how should you proceed yeah, to detect an exoplanet around a star? Yeah? Knowing that the exoplanet has maybe a flux ratio of a 1 to 100,000 or 1 to 1 million, yeah? and see whether it, it could work or not. What kind of a signal to noise you would need to achieve yeah, such an observation? Yeah? And this is a more academic, but well, I see it's a good way yeah, to enter the field. Yeah? Now, what I would do, I would identify yeah, a good sci scientific case yeah, in your area. Yeah, because when I know that you have your pet object, yeah, objects that you, you like very much. Yeah, in my case, yeah, it's about gravitational lenses. Yeah, and uh, this one, this was one of my motivation 20 years ago. Yeah, to enter the field of interferometry, I thought that wow, well, it would be possible. Yeah, to observe uh, well, multiply imaged objects. Yeah, uh, using interferometry techniques. Yeah, and in fact, uh, well. It's only about uh, one year ago that we could get the first observations of the microlensing event. And so uh, we could combine yeah, uh, well, interferometry with the gravitational lensing. And uh, well, a paper has been submitted, but it's in the referee process. And uh, once it will be accepted, well, hopefully, I send uh, the PDF to Prakash so that it will distribute yeah, to all the participants and see, well, as an example of a scientific case. But well, just think about your, your, your favorite objects, yeah? And uh, of course, you will have to figure out whether they are bright, sufficiently bright, yeah, to be observed in interferometry, yeah? So you will have to know what is the limiting magnitude achievable with uh, that interferometer or, or another interferometer, then the desired signal to noise, then the choice of baselines, would like to uh, the choice of the spectral band, the spectral resolution, etc. Yeah, and uh, once you are almost uh, ready, yeah, to well maybe to prepare a proposal, well I advise you to contact the Belgian DLTI Expertise Center. So we have a expertise center. Well, in fact, I contacted yesterday yeah, one of my former PhD students who is uh, Denis de Frère, Yeah. And well, he just told me, well, uh, yeah, we, we have a, a VLTA expertise center and you forgot that, you know, you're even uh, one of the members. So we are three, yeah? So there is also um, Olivier Apsil uh, with a very good expertise in interferometry also and uh, also adaptive optics, yeah? And so, well, here is a, is a link, yeah? If you'd like to get into contact with that uh, center once you, you have some ideas of what you would like to observe, yeah? And, uh, well, I guess uh, we may then discuss yeah, the feasibility yeah, of uh, any, any project. Yeah. Okay, and that's end uh, my presentation. And now, well, there is ample time, I guess, yeah, for questions, uh, comments, remarks, yeah? Of course, I mean, um, you know, this presentation was more about optical in infrared interferometry, but I mean, uh, many of the concepts are the same for ALMA, yeah, so millimeter or submillimeter interferometry, also for radio interferometry, yeah, so many, many concepts are the same. And sometimes, well, it's fantastic if uh, people get some ideas how to combine radio, millimeter, and optical interferometry yeah, all together. Combine as in use it for a single source? Yeah, hmm. it's possible. Well, I think people have done that, yeah, for the galactic center, we know, yeah. Um, uh, it has been observed, yeah, first in the radio. Yeah, very well studied in the radio wavelength. Then uh, with ALMA, and also in the optical, where, I mean, uh, you know, stars uh, revolving around the Central black hole, so called black, black hole, yeah, has been uh, observed, yeah, and uh, relati relativistic effects, yeah, predicted by general relativity, yeah, has been confirmed, yeah. So, 
Well, this is a nice example, of course, yeah, where it has been possible to combine interferometric techniques yeah, in a three different spectral bands. Yeah. Okay, so one question in the chat is, yeah. Uh, it's, it's asked whether tracking the fringes of a bright source is redundant when we have phase closure. Yeah, so, so tracking the fringes of a bright star is redundant when we have phase closures, yeah. No, 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 because uh, the reason is the following, yeah. Uh, what you would like to do, yeah, is to integrate the fringes, correct? Yeah. Uh, and if indeed, yeah, uh, the fringes, yeah, are are moving, well, the best is uh, to track these, yeah. Then you may integrate and get a much higher signal to noise ratio. All right. So you you need to do to do both, yeah. You need uh, to do uh, to retrieve yeah, the intrinsic source information on the phase. You need. Uh, 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 closure phase, yeah, but also you need the fringe tracker, yeah, to integrate the signal. Otherwise, uh, because, uh, you know, the, the fringes will go all over your detector, yeah, will, uh, you will get no signal at all, yeah. Uh, there's another question in the chat about, oh, why can't we obtain, uh, obtain phase information using two telescopes? Oh, yeah, using two telescopes, yeah, uh, no, you cannot get uh, phase information because uh, because as a, as I've shown, yeah, phi one two, the big phi one two is equal to beta one two plus small phi one two, where small phi one two is a piston uh, piston uh, phase shift, yeah, and uh, he, well, what you're measuring is a big phi one two, which is a summation of the two, yeah. So if you cannot get rid yeah, of the piston atmospheric effect, yeah, you cannot get uh, uh, access yeah, to the phase information related to the source. Yeah, no, impossible. Yeah, unless you find a way. Yeah, and then uh, you become uh, popular. Yeah, so just think. Well, I think the fringe itself disappears because of the uh, smearing that happens due to the atmospheric effects. And so the fringe strength itself goes away uh, so much yeah. so that it's difficult yeah. to measure any other quantity associated with it. Yeah, well, but what, what you can still do, yeah, when uh, you, you just observe with the two telescope, where you, you see the fringes, yeah, which are moving, and with the fringe tracker, you may follow and you may integrate, you see? But you don't get the phase information related to the source, yeah? But you may still integrate it if you have a, a fringe tracker. Yeah, yeah. This is, it, it is what is currently down. Yeah, yeah. And now, well, at the VLTI, they, are, they have a very nice instrument, so-called gravity. And gravity is its own yeah, fringe tracker, which is uh, well, the first instrument ever built again yeah, to have its own fringe tracker, rather than uh, many of the, the other VLTI instruments. Yeah, have a well independent fringe tracker, yeah, yeah, yeah. So of course we, we propose, yeah, with uh, with the Prakash and uh, with uh, Professor Dash, of course, that you know, well, you raise more questions, yeah, on the forum, yeah. So from time to time we'll still go to it, yeah. Then we also have uh, our you know individual email addresses, yeah, and uh, of course you may contact us, yeah, and uh, well, I think. Uh, well, as Professor Desch said, yeah, I think uh, Fourier transform changed the, the, the course of his life, yeah, and uh, well, I think I could say so because, well, I find it uh, so, so fantastic, yeah, it's a very nice uh, technique which can be applied yeah, to many different fields, yeah, and uh, so hope it will be useful to you too, yeah. So in the future, yeah, don't hesitate, yeah, to contact uh, Prakash, Professor Desh, or myself, yeah, and uh, well, and you know, we are. I think the three of us, yeah, are seduced, yeah, by the technique, yeah, and uh, uh, well, now, well, what's funny, yeah, and well, I, I'll come to Professor Desh with a question later, not now, yeah, but um, well, it happens that 
in gravitational lensing, yeah, uh, when uh, you try to derive the expression of the deflection angle, well, it just turns out to be a convolution product, yeah. And then when we had the idea, yeah, with one of my PhD students, yeah, just to apply Fourier transform, yeah, to the case of a gravitational lensing, yeah, and well, well, it, it allowed us, yeah, to find uh, sometimes solutions, yeah, that you could not find, yeah, in the original space, yeah. So it's a very nice tool which can be applied to so many different fields, yeah. And well, uh, I never thought, yeah, that well it could be used, yeah, for the theory of a gravitational lensing, yeah, but, yeah. Now I think there is another question. I've seen images of gravity to form mirrors, and it seemed to be aligned in a, li in a line. So is the direction based on information flows? No, I mean, well, well gravity, of course, yeah, is uh, an instrument, yeah, the focal plane of the VLTI, and uh, the four uh, big telescope beauties, yeah, occupy, uh, special positions, yeah, well, to avoid the uh, redundancy yeah, in the baselines, yeah, and uh, so they are not aligned in a line, no, not at all, and uh, the same is when you are using the four auxiliary telescope, I mean, uh, you never align them, yeah, along the line, even it's impossible, I know, to be useless, yeah. Yeah, yeah so the, I think the, the question is about whether the direction information of the baseline is lost. It's not lost. In fact, the way the direction of the baseline uh, is will decide how the visibility will occur, how the, uh, the perpendicular uh, averaging will take place uh, for the source. And uh, as the Earth rotates, uh, you will find that the same uh, set of locations will offer different, different baselines with different orientations. Yeah, I forgot to mention, yeah, that if you go to the web page, yeah, to the URL I showed before, uh, where Denis de Frey, yeah, also posted there several links, yeah, to uh, related uh, papers, yeah, on interferometry, well, on the techniques, yeah, on uh, also on the science, yeah. So, well, he just told me that yesterday, yeah, that you may retrieve yeah, some interesting scientific papers, yeah, and that you, you you will be able to understand, yeah, because I mean, uh, with the training, uh, there should be no difficulty. So, so we we, we 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 spend a very nice time, I think, you know, and uh, well, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Sekia, yeah, uh, because well, he had the idea, yeah, of organizing the school, yeah. Then well, I I thank him for uh, having put. Uh, us, you know, uh, in a connection, yeah, with Prakash, yeah, who has been uh, coordinating, yeah, you know, the discourse and, uh, well, all the quizzes, you know, well, the site, you know, everything, and, uh, well, it has been extremely positive, fruitful, yeah, uh, so thanks a lot, yeah, Prakash, yeah, thanks also to Professor Desh, yeah, uh, that I met also thanks to Professor Sekia, yeah, and uh, thanks a lot for your very exciting lectures, yeah, uh, to which uh, I'm sure, yeah, we, we, we will return, yeah, to, to better, you know, uh, deepen, you know, uh, everything what you, you, you told us, yeah. Well, it's very good that, that uh, all those lectures, yeah, have been recorded, yeah, so I think it's the richest source of information, yeah. And thanks uh, to all the participants, <laughs> without whom, yeah, uh, this, these lectures would not have uh, taken place, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, uh, After, uh, yeah. yeah, on behalf of uh, Ayuka and the TLC also, I would like to thank you and Anna and Prakash and Desh and all the participants. Uh, from whatever inputs we have received, it has been an excellent uh, series of talks. I'm sorry that because I started teaching as well, that I couldn't attend all of it, but uh, it'll be there in the web, it'll be there in the, in the, in the, in the Moodle site, and I'll follow it up later. But uh, thanks very much, Jo and, and, and all of you. And we look forward to your uh, future sets of lectures, possibly your gravitational lensing as well, which you mentioned. And yeah. it'll be lovely to have you again with us. Thank you thanks very much. Thanks a lot, thanks a lot, take care. Yeah, it's my turn to thank you. Uh, 
and uh, Prakash and Saikia and um, uh, as well as all the participants for uh, interesting discussion that uh, you know uh, kept us engaged uh, throughout this uh, series uh, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed different uh, you know illustrations that you had uh, uh, to clarify certain subtle issues uh, which was uh, amazing. Thank you. It's been a good learning experience. Yeah, yeah. Personally, I'm very grateful too. And I think I can say on behalf of the participants as well. So I learned it pretty much uh, the, the content of the lecture along with the participants. And I can say this is one of the best uh, fundamentals uh, of an advanced course that I've taken ever. Um, and it was very great uh, working with you as well. And thanks, uh, Avinash Deshpande, uh, for uh, the lectures on Fourier series. That was really useful too for the course. Yeah, thanks for making it possible. I should probably just put in a word of thanks to uh, Aniket as well, who worked with Anna to edit the videos and put it all together. And it has been wonderful, really. So we hope that we'll be able to repeat uh, similar things in the near as well as distant future. Thanks very much. Yeah, this has been a very rich experience also with Aniket, as you, as you mentioned. Yeah, yeah very nice. I, and I guess that the YouTube yeah, presentations yeah, will remain accessible forever, or how is it, Rakesh? No, that will be remain public. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. those links will be sent to the participants. I think it's already been sent once, but I can, at the end of the course, I'll send again. But you can share it with your friends or whoever is interested. and. The resources will be available all the time. Okay, so bye bye to everybody and uh, bye, Jean. Bye, everybody. Thanks again, yeah. Bye, bye, Jean. Bye, bye, bye. bye everyone.